Thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm Steve Meyer. I'm the exhibition manager here at the Sky. And I'm just super thrilled to have these guys <coughs> here today. Um, I just want to welcome Kelly, our exhibiting artist on the walls around us, Kelly Connell, and Nancy Floyd, and Natalie Crick. Um, I'm going to start with our thank acknowledgments. Uh, we have this guy on the acknowledge that our programming is being held on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Taklamet, Clackamas, Bands of Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Mulala, and many other tribes who make their homes along the Columbia, Lamar, and Willamette, and Willamette. Uh, I also want to say we wouldn't be putting on these awesome exhibitions without some folks to recognize and thank. So I want to thank our funders, our donors, and our many members, and of course our many volunteers that come and make decisions on what shows or the exhibition committee. There's a couple folks here. If you want to raise your hand if you're on our committee. Um, and also, um, as our general volunteers who come to help us out at our fest test, we have Lizzie, our summer intern, and also Mrs. Yu Young there, um, one of our staff members, and Molly, our committee, and Harper, our gallery manager, are both out of town, but they've done their best wishes to you guys. <laughs> um, I also want to uh, let everyone know that we've got some books for sale by Kelly and Nancy, as well as uh, books for. Uh, by Skylark Editions that are Natalie's uh, Natural Deceptions Project. So if folks wanted to take a look at those actors, we'll be finding as well. Um, and since you're here, check out our Jennifer Jodescu show, which is in the back, and also um, Bean Gillsburg, who is in my gallery. Um, two really great shows to also see while you're here. Um, and lastly, I just want to shout out our 2022 Pacific Northwest Drawers artists. We're having next Friday uh, our very first Drawers mini presentation at the gallery, so 10 of our tourist artists will be here giving very short eight-minute presentations about their work. Um, it'll be really fun and cool. We have some of those artists here today as well. So everyone has a full bio and a full statement um, about the artist's work at your seat. So I'm just going to do a quick intro bio for all y'all. And then uh, basically format, I've got a couple of questions and we'll just let the artist talk. And um, so Kelly Connell is a Chicago-based artist whose work investigates sexuality, gender, identity, and photographer-centered relationships. The large-scale color photographs in double life appear to document the lives of two women in a relationship. And actually, these images are visually created montages of the same model, Eva Jacobson. Seen double, that she plays both characters in each scenario. The project's 20-year span opens up new dialogues about women and aging and explores polarities of identities such as the masculine and feminine psyche, the irrational and rational self, and the motivated and resigned. And Nancy Floyd is based in Bend, Oregon, and has been an exhibiting artist um, for 40 years. Her interests include the aging female body, the passage of time, barren landscapes, and trees. She uses photography, video, and mixed media to address the ways in which landscape media can connect deeply with experience and memory. Floyd has continued to make work for her self-portrait series, Weathering Time, since 1982. While Weathering Time chronicles Floyd's youth to the dawn of her old age, the images also reflect the experiences of her generation and underscore the cultural, technological, and physical changes that have occurred over the past 39 years. And lastly, Natalie Crick is a Seattle-based artist whose work investigates visual perception and pleasure through complicating the act of looking. Crick has been working on her series, Natural Perception, since 2010 photographing her mother, sister, and self. The resulting pictures, portraits, and fragmented photographs of their stylized bodies mimic the alluring glamour and artifice found in magazines while mocking the idea of being easy on the eyes. In the act of embodying these tropes, cultural species become personal, pointing to the way photography influences the fantasies and fictions we have created about ourselves. And I just want to say on a personal note, I'm also really excited that Kelly in particular is here because she was my one of my professors in graduate school in Chicago. And something that was really cool that came up as I was reading everyone's bio is that we actually are all connected by Chicago. And all went to, well, three of us went to Columbia College for school, uh, graduate school. And Kelly has been teaching there for oh, 2007. 2007. So, yeah, so it's just it's a great 
a great space to have all of us together. But I just want to thank everybody again for being here, and thank everybody for being here as well. Um, okay, so first question. Um, so each of you have spent many years working on one project. What keeps you committed to making new work for your project? And is there any point in sight?
always curiosity of what's going to look like in 10 years, what's going to look like in 20 years. It started out just being about my body. Over 20 years, what would I look like? And then as time went on, and there were other ideas within the work in terms of the environment around me and what was in those pictures, um, I started thinking, well, what, do, what will it be like in 20 years from now, from, say, cell phones or typewriters to computers, that sort of thing. Um, again, you know, it's, it's one project that we do, right? But it's also that, for me, it's just curiosity that I can keep doing it because I'm still interested in making the pictures and equally I'm interested in what people think about the pictures over time. You know, and also getting ideas from other people about what I should put in, you know, collecting the pictures um, based on what they've seen in the photos. I think kind of connected to that question, um, how does working with your subjects, either your models, yourself, or other participants, over a lot of your time um, shifted your project or what you thought maybe conceptually at the beginning, um, or and or surprised you along the way? Um, well, I feel like my project kind of started as a surprise. Um, I was working on uh, well, I was in graduate school, and I was photographing women who I met on the internet and like going over their homes and giving them makeovers and taking <laughs> pictures. And uh, my mom came to visit me, and I decided to photograph her, and I just dressed her as me, and I photographed her in my bedroom. And I was really, I guess I didn't necessarily think that the pictures would be as interesting as they ended up being for me. Like personally, I was like, oh wow, this is woman who's very familiar to me, she's my mother, but all of a sudden she is playing someone else and I could, in some ways I couldn't recognize her. And then um, she also seemed to be playing like potentially like my future self, like an older version of me. Um, and so that kind of sparked the project, that, that first um, photo session in 2009. Um, and then that just, I kept going back to her uh, after that. And, um, but then after graduate school, I had been photographing her the whole time I was in school. And then afterwards, I was in Chicago for a year, and it was, you know, working, full-time job. Couldn't really get to Colorado very often to make photographs. So another surprise, the project that led me to move back in with my parents for a few years to finish the project. Um, but then as all this time passed, um, I think there was something about, you know, continuing to work with the same person um, that I really, it really led to me like, shifting the way that I was making work. Um, at the beginning, I was photographing her kind of more, I, I don't I guess they were closer to like traditional portraits, like I would um, dress her up and then photograph her as if it was like an actual portrait. But then I started, and I was printing them in the dark room, and then um, once I moved to Colorado, I bought a digital camera, and then I was very much more interested in making images that were like trippy to look at on multiple levels. Um, her kind of identity shifts from image to image, and there's kind of a fluidity there. And then I also photographed my older sister and myself, and there's something about like, like using the three of us to kind of meld our identities together, and I think sometimes it's hard to tell who's who. Um, but then once I moved to Colorado, I started to make pictures that kind of embraced some kind of optical illusions and were kind of difficult to figure out what was going on. Yeah, I just really appreciate what you just said about um, how things shifted over time and you're, you can see yourself and your mom and your mom and you and your sister even were changing places. Um, for me, I very much use Kiva as a model that I work my ideas through. So for her, if she's ever at an art opening, it's interesting because people read these as self-portraits and they will go immediately to her and start talking with her, <laughs> which is great because I'm really introverted and it like, lets me off the hook when I go to <laughs> uh, And she's an extreme extrovert, so you know when she's in the room. So it, it's really fun to have her there. Um, 
But that is interesting that people often see these as self-portraits, and I, I guess it's just because of our training through the history of photography, when you see a single subject over and over, it normally is self-portraiture. But what's being portrayed in the work very much comes from my own life experience, or um, I get ideas from reading books or watching people in public, but I will want her to act them out. So for her, when she looks at the work, she doesn't really see them as a portrait of her. She thinks that they're just her acting, and the tone of the work is much more in line with my personality. If I were going to make her portrait, it would be very different than this if I set out to do that. Um, but yeah, working over time, how things have changed, I'm trying to think what surprised me. Um, I think as we've gotten older, because we met in our 20s when we were in school, and at the time, what, I was just trying to figure out my sexuality then. So I had been married before to a man, and I found myself attracted to women too. Didn't quite know what to do with that. So I was at a real pivotal like point in my own sexuality, and didn't know how to meet other women. And like if I made eyes with someone in the supermarket, I'd look 100% straight, so it just wasn't working. <laughs> so I think I was really watching people at that time to see how they interact and what clothing they wore and how they sat and how they interacted with one another. And she was really great taking on different roles that might have showed a more masculine side or feminine side, embodying that same one person that could take on multiple sides of themselves. So that's how it was going at the beginning, but now that I've been in a long-term relationship for a long time, and I've changed as a person, and society has changed too with how we think about gender and sexuality, um, naturally what I'm bringing up in the photographs have changed. So if they're playing pool and making out in a car, now they're going to bed early and <laughs> renovating a house. Or but, um, yeah, and then we've also changed in our own lives, like, you know, we've, I've lost my dad, she's lost her dad, there's like things that, big life moments have happened for both of us, that I think on a personal level, this project has kept us together as close friends that can like bring that through the work too, over time. So this project that I've been working on has been going for 40 years, so it's had different surprises over the last 40 years. And the first one was in that after 20 years, I made a video of all the still images, and that's when it became clear to me that it wasn't just my body aging over time. In fact, I didn't look that much older at 20 years, or, you know, 45 versus 25, but there were things in the photographs like typewriters and telephones and books and hairstyles and fashions, and so, that became some of the motivation of the, after the first 20 years to keep going and like, well, what pants am I wearing this week, et cetera. But what I find now that's surprising to me is that um, it's sort of like George O'Keefe talking about Stieglitz photographs of her when she was younger and her saying that's not me anymore, that's as a, a stranger, and that's how I see my younger self now. Um, only when people ask me, what were you thinking back then, do I kind of try to put myself back in that place? But I see this person that's standing there, and she's a young person that I recognize and I'm familiar with, but she's not me anymore. The other thing that's surprising, and this has just happened since I moved then, and I don't know, maybe it's because I retired from my day job, or I'm feeling older, but when I look at my photographs now, I'm much more judgmental about the way I look. Like, am I slumped? Am I doing you know, something that makes me look unattractive, etc. And it's not that I'm saying, oh, that's terrible, I'm not going to show it, because clearly I keep showing them. But I'm noticing that, and I realize that when you're young, you look a certain way, and even if you have a bad hairstyle or you're in frumpy clothing, you still look cute. <laughs> it's in the quote-unquote context of what is attractive in our society, right? So now when I wear, you know, grudging frumpy clothes or my hair is all messed up, I, I look like, you know, a crazy woman. <laughs> and so that's been a, a, a sort of a, a sign for me, like, oh, well, maybe I should embrace that, which I have to, because obviously I'm not going to change the way I photograph. 
and to describe that as briefly, um, I try not to perform anything. I try to just stand there and not smile so you can sort of see the body still, because I'm so interested about the aging body, but also just because I want to continue the formula. Um, and the third thing that surprised me about the photographs is how many young people are interested in the photographs. And I can kind of think of, when I was younger, being curious about the aging process, but not being able to touch it, because obviously it was someplace else that was going to be down the road. So I, I guess there's this curiosity in me about their curiosity of my photographs as I age. choose which two images I'm going to use 
I erase myself and put her in there twice. So if you put the ones that were me and me together, they would just not work because I just don't have what <laughs> she's laughing at. It's true. But, um, and I'm probably not doing the best acting because I'm paying attention to her and directing. But um, yeah, so I also think like, uh, Oh, what was I going to say? I lost my train of thought. Um, what was your second part of the question? Anything about uh, why audience interpretation? Oh, audience interpretation. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I do really love that the audience has to realize a few things that might shake up their idea of what a photograph is. So one thing that happens is people usually think these are the same. They're one couple in a relationship might take them to like the fourth or fifth picture that they're like, wait a minute, this is the same one person, not two people. So I like that, that I've just, in that moment, hopefully helped further a conversation between what's real in a photograph and how photographs are fiction to begin with. And then um, having her play me and people think they're self-portraits further complicates that too because I'm really interested in breaking boundaries between our ideas in society about relationships and gender and sexuality. So um, those serve the work in that way. So when I started my project in 82, there was no digital cameras. And the methodology I use is that each month is on one roll of film. So I would see myself portraits, sometimes for six to eight months down the way when I would process the film. So in the beginning, although they were self-portraits, they weren't instantly looked at, and so I didn't know what was happening within the frames. But as I was making them, I mean, I was a young student photographer, and I would be submitting the shows, and I would submit the photographs, and would be told um, in sort of polite, critique ways that these were boring photographs that, you know, I'm just standing in front of something, I've sort of plopped myself in front of the camera, um, and there really wasn't anything to engage with. Um, and so, in terms of the self-portraits, I kind of liked that idea because I was a young feminist, and I really hated the way women were being photographed back then, and so sort of the objectification of women. And I also liked the idea that I was looking at myself, a female looking at my body, as opposed to a male photographer looking at me. So I actually embraced the idea of doing self-portraits in a way that I wouldn't do the beginning. Um, and with that, um, I continued the project. Um, and so in terms of, of later on, you know, people will look at my slideshows, I'll do a presentation, and someone will say, well, I noticed that you have pants, a lot of different pants styles in your photographs. And then I'll think, oh, I should do a series on the pants in my photographs. <laughs> So, so what starts out as sort of a personal self-portrait exploration that becomes sort of a, a young feminist way of like saying fuck you to the world in terms of the way my body looks um, became this sort of, I want to hear what people have to say about my work because I realize it does really influence in some ways how I do things. I mean, I still have my formula, but I shift things around based on what people say to me. And I never have really felt offended by, by by people who don't like the work, right? I think that there's something really important about listening to those criticisms, um, and it can also further the, the project in a way that I never imagined. Thank you. Yeah, and I think uh, folks I've heard go on to Nancy's website and you really dive deeply into the sets that you've created, and I was looking at them last night, and it's, it is really great to have these now to be able to distinguish these different sets, either it's timeline or it's you have one about pants, and <laughs> there's one about like technology, about like, the phone and how it's changed. So it's, it's really fascinating to, to look back at. So you can add them up here, you can take a look at it afterwards. Um, but yeah, there's so much more because you've made like 2,500? More than that. More than that. <laughs> yeah. That was my last count. Yeah. <laughs> Um, my last question um, centers around your performance, which you've all kind of mentioned at one point in talking about your work today. Um, so 
So I was just curious what what does performance in the role of it or or identity performativity, like how does that play out in your work as well? Well I'm really interested in how we kind of see ourselves through pictures and kind of create our own identity through like a collection of pictures. And I you mentioned um, uh, O'Keefe earlier, and I remember talking to you, Kelly, when I was in graduate school about um, um, like Stieglitz kind of thinking that like this project or all of his pictures of her, um, it wasn't about the one portrait, it was about like the collection of pictures that kind of could like reveal more about her. Um, do you remember talking about yeah. that? Um, and I, I was really interested in that because I was like, oh, I think, I think it's the opposite. <laughs> <laughs> like, I like, I like this idea of, like, many pictures of the same person actually confusing and, like, really challenging with the idea of, like, what our identity is and, like, proving that it can be, like, fluid or, like, many different things. Um, so I think that I have used performance in my photographs to kind of um, and the way that I work, because my work is highly staged, um, I so it's I would say it's pretty far from like an authentic performance. <laughs> I like I look at a lot of photographs um, in popular culture. Um, when I was in school, I was just collecting like all of the magazines that I could, looking at all the celebrity portraits, um, and. Um, I collected a bunch of like vintage Playboy magazines, and I was really just interested in the way that women were photographed and how like the body was sexualized through photography, and like how there were these certain choices that were made, like pose or styling, all these things that were supposed to like kind of point to sex, even though they were like artists and performance. Um, so that's how I um, would go about like making a picture. Like, see a, a photograph, maybe by like, the French photographer before dawn, and I'd be like, oh, I love this picture, but it makes me so uncomfortable, it's really pretty fucked up, <laughs> but it's so beautiful. So I always have this like very, I have a very complicated um, relationship to a lot of the photographs that I end, and then end up remake um, for, with my mom or my sister. And I think that there's there's also that, that um, idea of performance there, that knowing that this is a picture of my mom, like doing the sexy pose for her daughter, and like how does that like, kind of complicate the idea of like how we read this photograph? Like once the viewer knows um, who the photographer is and who the model is. Um, yeah. So for this work, it's highly performative, even though it doesn't look performative. Um, we spend a lot of time choosing the props and the location and the exact clothes that are being worn normally. So now that we don't live in the same city, she lives in um, Denton, Texas still, and I live in Chicago. Um, I'll fly there and hang out there for like a week, or I'll fly her out to Chicago. So um, in the meantime, I keep a sketchbook where I keep quite a few ideas, and the ideas are usually based on a scenario or an emotion I want to work through, but sometimes I will just find a location where I know I need to make a picture of that location. Um, but everything in how she's being directed is performed, and I usually say, okay, this one's feeling this way, this one's reacting this way, and then we'll riff on it. But the performance is a little bit fluid, where if she just has an idea and wants to try something, totally cool with her not sticking to the script. So that's really fun. And she's so comfortable in her body. I'm really glad to be able to work with her. She's, um, if we're lucky enough to have another friend show up, someone I know that she doesn't even know, she's really easy to just sit down and start working with them. She's so comfortable in her own skin that I think that helps. And I also think the work helps by having another person there from the beginning instead of just open air. Like there's an energy that's really captured between two people even if you, you can just kind of tell that someone was there. So what she and I experienced
pieced together is still through the images or whoever the stand-in was. So that's part of the performance <coughs> that's a little bit behind the scenes that, um, yeah, is important to your work. Well, I see where my time is an anti-performance set of <laughs> portraits. Um, it was very um, consciously described. I just consciously described to people exactly what I wanted, which was that the camera would be at the same angle, like it was the same lens, somewhat the same distance, if that changes over time depending on where I am, but, um, and that I wouldn't smile, and I wouldn't do anything with my body to you know, enhance the posture or whatever, so it would just be like a blank slate of the, of the camera. I guess you could say that in itself is a performative act, um, in that I'm choosing that, but that was it. It was like this formula that I would use. And in fact, I actually have a category within my series called performing for the camera. Because sometimes I do perform for the camera. <laughs> where um, there's a photograph of my husband and I have a buffalo behind us. And so we're, we're looking at the buffalo instead of at the camera. Or I'm leaning upside down at my monument. And so those become my performative series. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to open it up to some questions, but first I was going to ask, do you have questions for each other? Um, and you can have some time to think about it. Um, and I also wanted to mention, so you did, as you were saying, you're all three constantly working on projects besides this work. And I know that Natalie and Kelly are collaborating together on a project called The Man, um, which is, I watched a, a talk about it last night as well from uh, Photography by the Northwest, um, which is really, really intriguing, and I'm super excited to see that project continue. Um, and then, Nancy, I know you've been doing some work in some national forests, I think, around where you're starting to do some work, but you're, you're also just yes. continually working on other projects. So uh, I just love that it's not just one focus on one thing, and it's our work that you're just kind of constantly thinking and constantly whatever else you do to bring in your day to day. Um, but yeah, if you guys have questions for each other, um, all there, but also I'll open it up to the crowd uh, for folks who have questions for the artists. Um, just go ahead and raise your hand. And... I mean, I would love to hear what else you're working on. <laughs> you're that excited about that you're working on. Do you guys want to talk a little bit about your Um, yeah, so I have been, 
I guess for the last year and a half or so, I, I just stopped making pictures altogether because Kelly and I have been using appropriated imagery, and then I've also been using appropriated imagery in my own work. Um, but my, my process has changed quite a bit, and now I've been working in the studio and like making like physical collages and um, and objects really that are like very reflective and put in the present, um, just as like a way to you know further challenge the way that we look at. Um, so, um, as well as the project I'm working on with Natalie, where we're doing a lot of hand cut and digital collaging, um, which is really fun. It's like out of the box and not a way that I'm familiar with working that much. So, it's been really fun to pack images back and forth and see where that leads. But the other project that I'm working on is called Pictures for Keras, and I started it in 2014. And it's actually going to be a book published by Aperture in 2024. So um, I've been, uh, it's a loosely about Karis Wilson and her relationship with Edward Weston and the time they lived together in the Carmel area. And I uh, read the book that they published called California in the West in 1940. She wrote all the text for that and he took 96 photographs in that book. And then she also wrote an autobiography called Through Another Lens, My Years with Edward Weston. And I just became so captivated, captivated by her as a person that I wanted to know as much about her as I could. So I went to the Center for Creative Photography in Tucson, Arizona, where her archives are and Weston's archives are. And then in the meantime, Betsy, my wife, uh, Betsy and I have traveled to California and back, and I've made portraits of her in the same places where Weston and Karis made work together. And I've also made landscapes in the same places where Weston made landscapes. So the book will look at their relationships, our relationship, and then it's a long text that I've written that will be interwoven with that as well. So this fall, I think I'm going to do one more trip out west. I keep thinking it's over, and then I just keep going again. <laughs> so I don't know if I'm going to just reshoot pictures that never make it in. And, but um, I think I'm going to do one more trip. And it sure is gorgeous up here, so I'm going to even drive all the way up to Portland. <laughs> nice. So I'm starting a project about the trees of Oregon, and I've been going over to the H.J. Andrews Forest to follow around scientists and students as they basically map trees and study the overgrowth and the undergrowth and how they relate to each other during climate change and different weather effects. Um, but I'm also going to be going out and finding stakeholders. Um, so, and those could be loggers, they could be environmentalists, they could be park rangers, anyone who's doing work around the tree orchards, um, the um, people who cut down the, the limbs and the trees around it, the electric wires, keep fires from happening, anything like that. I'm really curious about how we understand trees um, in Oregon because it is such a big part of who my, myself included now since I've been for five years um, feel that you know, this is a beautiful state because of the trees. And, um, but we also need to have houses and we also need to have, you know, we've got paper in our hands which comes from trees. So I want to interview different people and learn what their experiences are. Um, and then a third part of the project will just be be me out of the woods making sort of much more interpretive um, photographs about trees. And that, that third part is something that I can't talk about yet because I haven't started it. Um, but it'll be much more experimental in nature. Um, my last project that I just finished a few years ago was about walking through the desert. And so I've shifted away from portraiture, which I've done all my life, into becoming more interested in making sort of interpretive photographs about my experiences in the outdoors. Great, thanks everyone for sharing what you're working on right now. Thanks for the question. Um, any other questions in the audience for any of the artists or all the others? Yeah. Um, I really love Yeah, I, I 
I mean, I take a lot of inspiration from him, um, specifically his use of color. Um, I remember learning about his work when I was an undergraduate student, and I was, I just felt in love like it, but I also felt lots of other feelings. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I definitely, well, now I've been making stuff that's in black and white, which is weird, but <laughs> for a long time I was really trying to use color as kind of like a, a lure to like draw the viewer in and then also, um, you know, kind of point to this like fashion influence and I think that also can help kind of trick people into thinking like, oh, I think I know what I'm looking at. Oh wait, this is not what I thought it was. Um, as far as other influences, so many. <laughs> <laughs> Pedro Almodovar is amazing. 
piece of wood on the hallways. I love to have the like, stories he writes for women to play. Photograph Natalie 
but how, what we would learn or not learn from that, it's like such an interesting thing between that photographer subject dance and what's shown in a portrait. But over time, I get to where I'm even more confused by portraiture and what you can really tell or not. Because there is truth, but there's also a fiction. We can never quite get close enough as like we can with someone's voice or seeing them in a moving three dimension or feel they're present next to us, it's always going to be a remove, no matter what. You know, you just think about, um, in the context of like, photojournalism, which is about truth, right? And, and so going back to this idea of an art photographer who isn't necessarily interested in factual information, um, and that context is everything. So, you know, Kelly set herself this project up as a certain context that we understand. And I was just talking to her earlier where I started reading the photographs differently after seeing them on the wall for the first time. Um, because it, in the original state, it was that this, it's these two characters, and now I don't see them as two characters, I see them as one character. Just different time periods of her, her, her life. Maybe it's a few seconds in between, maybe it's a few years in between. So I'm with you. I think that that's why portraiture is always so interesting to me, is that it had so many facets, and over time you change the way you look at that photograph of a person. Yeah, you know, you know, you look back at pictures of you from 1982, you don't, it's not like you're looking at you anymore. So right. like, even though you're, you're the most like documentary of the project here, there's still kind of that. And your work's such a fascinating like document of culture in the time. I absolutely love that so much. And I've just started seeing small parts of that happen in mine. Like this picture here, she's on the phone. And she was really on the phone, but I don't think that phone is still there. But that picture used to be edited out of the series for a long time, so I thought the fashion was so bad. <laughs> but, um, now I really like that. Jean skirt that was made out of a bunch of jeans. <laughs> yep. um, but yeah, I, so I love that your work has that element of just like, just by showing the environment and the rooms that you're in, we learn so much. Yeah, I mean, one of the things that's interesting to me is you each in your own way sort of said that the, 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 the initial impetus for the work was to understand something more about yourself, but that, that it kind of quickly turned into, I don't like the way you're looking at things, and it's, and it's too shallow, it doesn't make sense. I mean, obviously, in Kelly's work, you, you know, you sort of casually said, and of course, the, our attitudes toward sexuality have changed in the last 20 years, but that's not really important. I mean, it's a big deal. And if you think about it, 2002, you're making these pictures in a time when, um, you know, there was a large part of the culture that said God is striking down homosexuals because they are evil. That was, that was sort of, I don't know if that was a majority view, but it was a, <laughs> it was a significant view. And we covered a lot of ground at this time that changes the meaning of the word. And I think, I think to sort of say, okay, I have a, I have a very personal core that started me on this journey, but you're, we're all people together. So you need to come on this journey with me, I think is, even though you have very different approaches, mm -hmm. you know, very documentary, very wild, <laughs> you know, and everything in between, I think that's, that's kind of the core that, that links them up. I just think about how photography has changed, oh, yeah. like, and how we, as a culture, have changed in the past, like, 10 years. Like, the, I remember when I was working on this project, I was talking to someone and she, she mentioned selfie and I was like, what's a selfie? <laughs> <laughs> like that was such a different moment and that was the way that we were consuming imagery. It was like, mm -hmm. but there wasn't, <laughs> just not makes me feel very old. <laughs>
feel free to send the chat with the artist directly um, if, you have, if you have any questions that come up or just to say hello. Um, thank you so much, Natalie, Kelly, and Nancy for coming and traveling out here. Uh, it's been just such a pleasure to have you all here and to see your faces in person. <laughs> We've had a lot of Zoom talks with folks over the last few years, so it's really nice to be like, here in the space together. Uh, and yeah, as I mentioned, there are books for sale uh, at the <coughs> table in the next room uh, that Kelly and Nancy will be selling. Um, and yeah, any other questions? But yeah, feel free to.